So, uh, yeah, the background, by the way, guys, I've always wanted to be in Red Dwarf, and so this is the closest I could get to it. So yeah. that's why I've yeah. done it. Um, They're all pointing yeah. to you, Paul. We'll that's go back and do Crichton if we can get David onto Zoom. But uh, today we're going to move on to, to episode two of series two, which, as you will all know, is better than life, which actually is a pretty important episode in many ways. Um, Rob, you have a little surprise for us? Um, yes, uh, guys, how many of you are here? That's that'll do at least half. over 200. So, uh, yeah, okay. We oh, I've lost him. Yes, Ed is sat down, correct? Yes, I am okay. I'm just sitting down today. We have a special guest, the one and the only, hey! nearly normal Norman, <laughs> Captain Norm. Oh, look at that. Yay, greetings, Norm. Norm. Hi, Norm. Way, Hi. Norm. Norm. Way. Hey, there he oh, is. Norman. Yeah, you're a popular boy. We don't get stuff like this. We don't ever get, except Ed very often gets how pretty he is, but nothing Yeah, else. I do, in fairness. Looking good at the guys. Norman, for the guys yeah. are going to want to know, they know you were ill a few weeks ago and you don't look like a man who's been recently ill. How are you feeling? 31st, it, when I told you the date, I checked on the papers from the hospital. It was the 31st of March I was admitted and came out on the 7th of April. So that's quite a while ago. So yeah. I was in for seven days, yeah, and had treatment. And, uh, and, and uh, how was it? Did you go into intensive care, Norm? I mean, how bad was it? Well, quite bad. I was very uh, confused most of the time and didn't, I had no appetite. And they were giving me injections, left wrist, right wrist, everywhere. And uh, yeah, just uh, it was weird, very weird. You got a you got a welcome from Canberra, Australia. There, Norman. Say hi to. Oh, from Louis. Germany, from Robert. Hi, hi uh, guys. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but you you how are you feeling now, Norman? You're walking. You're breathing. You're okay. You're fine. Breathing, yeah, fine. I mean, the problem I had was a cough. I had a dry cough and uh, and confusion. You've always been confused, Norman. Right? Yeah, 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 no difference. I said to them, I said, look, I've always been confused, so <laughs> it's got a bit worse. That's all. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it, it's, true. it's true. Oh, oh, wait a minute! Hold the hold. Hold the thing. Uh, Ed's apparently just lost his best-looking guy. Yes, I did. No, I wasn't going to draw that to anybody's attention. Oh, that, that is what. But, it's but they have noticed that you're no longer red. Yeah, it's because I'm somewhere else. So all I can say is that is some sort of problem with the um, color correction. Hey, plows keep not in hill and not in Hertfordshire. <laughs> this rather pale, washed-out version of him is closer to the truth, guys, although even not quite that good-looking as he is at the moment. Uh, you know, Red by, as you're now known. You know, you know, Paul, I do have a lawyer, and I am ready for it. <laughs> it oh, all we need is lawyers. Uh, yeah. Ed, we love lawyers. Bring them on. Got them on the other end um, of the phone, mate. Mr. Red fair job by, as he's known. <laughs> right, that's it. I shall, we, shall, we, uh, shall we talk about uh, Better Than Life? Lawyer. Yeah. yeah, okay. We're moving yeah, to yeah, Better Than Life. life. Uh, uh, the, the usual cuss warning, there may be cussing. Um, and uh, we Let's did lose, for all of you who didn't know, we, have, we lost, uh, uh, we couldn't get uh, David F Ross up and connected. We're going to try and keep trying. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're going out of order this week because we wanted, no, we're not. We're in order this week. Uh, in order this week. This is series two, show two, better than life. Um, and uh, I love this episode too. I mean, this was a, a fantastic idea. This, is, um, this episode is distinctive in the fact that this is the first time we've seriously left the studios to go out on location. And we, uh, as you probably all know, the, one of the intentions was, was to try and find a place that looked like paradise. That turned out to be real beach. That's all we could afford. <laughs> And I can tell you now, if somebody said to me, here, yeah, real beach, it's paradise, I would, have, I would have shot them. It's a beautiful place, real. It's beautiful. The I'm beach. Gonna, I'm not going to play this video because I'm going to get up every time I'm going to play it. <laughs> it was huge, the beach, wasn't it? It just went, oh, my goodness. It was not a particularly nice uh, no, day. It was a difficult day to shoot paradise in. And where did we shoot the thing when we were, were on a rubbish dump somewhere, wasn't it? On another uh, episode? another episode, yeah. That was... Um, that? Uh, Thanks for the memory. Thanks for the memory. And we did shoot yeah. on a rubbish dump. That was too noble. The rubbish was so compressed that it caught fire and it glowed <laughs> underneath the ground. 
And I thought, this is a great location. No consideration of the fact we all be gassed or yeah. burnt to death. <laughs> Rachel Williams is blessed to be from Wales. Paul, that'd be interesting to you. Right. Uh, you should have come to land under. Well, indeed. Uh, no, sorry, it's what Rachel was saying about Wales. He's referring to the fact that I am actually Welsh. Guys, should we start this episode? Yeah. Oh, I'm talk about being Welsh. <laughs> Honestly, and if you don't do it, they'll be penciled. Okay, guys, we're about to press uh, play. <laughs> Oh, he's got off to get his pencils now. Look at that. Well, he's mysteriously disappeared. I bet that Marilyn Monroe actress was cold. Someone just said. Yeah, I'll bet she was. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we're going to press uh, play in three, two, one, play. And there we uh, go. We have I'm a on the brush. <laughs> right, I can sit down now. Sorry, guys, I had to go and press my play over the other side of the room. Okay. So as Ed said, this, the big thing here is um, that, we, that we go outside the ship for the first time, which of course creates an entirely different dynamic and opens up so much more uh, space. Um, but we start off with a lovely comic scene with the game of chess, yeah? And the post pod arriving. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were, you know, as, as writers, we, because uh, the model shots had cost so much on the first season, we couldn't really afford any... Uh, any proper uh, outside uh, broadcast shooting. So this was a real treat for us. And we thought, ooh, you know, we can, we can go anywhere, do anything. We, you know, basically you get three days in real, but it was exciting to us. <laughs> I mean, the usual challenge, of course, with sci-fi is where do you go to locations that don't look like a quarry? Yeah. And the answer to that is there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, a beautiful coastline all around Wales. I actually come from near Aberystwyth and Borth and uh, Aberdavi and around there is my, uh, is my uh, local beautiful, beautiful beach. And in this weather, it would be lovely there. Yeah, it's really windy. windy, windy, windy uh, well, if you'd asked me, I'd have said Aberdavi. <laughs> or Ernest Lass is the There real. you are, no, you're up doing the Bernie in There's quite a lot of contemporary references in this one, which I've had this well, That was our first joke. That was a letterbox flying through the air. <laughs> you see it just turning at the front of shot. It was actually a letterbox. I, I hadn't noticed that. Uh, uh, what is a Bernie in, Rob? You need to explain what a Bernie in is. Uh, a Bernie in is like a harvester, uh, you know, a chain restaurant where uh, where you really shouldn't go. <laughs> I think they've gone now, aren't they? they? They don't exist anymore, do they? I don't think they do. Uh, we did back for a scatto and steak and chips was the main they went, they went with the golden egg. Prawn cocktail, yeah. Oh, no, Kerry Neal's Netflix has done. House, House of Pancakes, IHOP, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, Norm, in this... Yeah, am, I in, am I in this? Yes, you are. You are. Don't worry. Coming up. But in this episode, important scene in, you got coming we, we up. We played a lot with the way you looked in the various series. In series one and two, we pixelated you a great deal, um, probably rather unfairly. But in this series, we oh, decided God. to unleash your full beauty onto the screen. And really look at him now. I mean, you can see why. Yeah. Look at that, that face. Worth the a million thing. dollars. Look at it. Yeah, that pixelation was horrible. I didn't like mm. it. I'm I sorry. Don't know who thought of that normally. We thought we were being modern and futuristic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I always uh, said to you, I said, no, make him look like me, really, or the bloke you meet at a bus stop chatting to you, you know. Yes, I know. We we just in class is that, but then we gave in to pressure in this series and did ah. exactly that. I agree with you, Claire, and his class is the best speech in the world. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is that, uh, I mean, I don't know if, um, how many fans know this, but initially, Norman wasn't actually in it visually. He was just a voice because we thought we'd try and do a howl thing. It was like right. 2001. Here he, is. Here he comes. Yeah, it's Look at that. Oh, that is crisp. I can't see what you're seeing. Yeah, well, you can, well, you're lucky because you'd faint. He's so gorgeous. <laughs> Are you watching on your phone, Norm, or did you not bother? On your phone? Remember, you were going to watch the episode on YouTube on your phone. Oh, well, you're in this now, Norm. This you're in it now, now, Norm. You're on. I don't know that. I don't know that. You're telling him about the post pod. And it's and, just arrived. And the scooters come in, they're playing cowboys. So, to go back to that, Norm, about you not, not being a vision initially, um, how did you manage to persuade Rob and Doug to uh, get yourself into vision? 
because originally you were just a, in um, an un, unseen voice. Yeah, I was just a voice. I said, I well, I, as I said, I'd been, I'd done some telly before I did this, and I guess so, I just thought I'm doing telly, but I can't be seen. That's a bit weird. Oh. I just found it weird. I mean, you know, there's been, I know there's been voiceovers on just cleaning my glasses. I put too much. Um, coconut oil on my face today and it, it, my, it keeps sliding down my face. Do you use that to keep your hair in the control? Uh, no yeah, mainly oil? for hair and skin, yeah. good for skin, very good. Now listen Norm, so when you were bumped up to Envision, I presume you got a significant pay rise? I certainly did because uh, I was getting £265 a week for Red Dwarf, I mean, I mean, that, you know, a lot of money. How much? I'm sure it was le even less than that. Anyway, that, that went up because uh, my agent said, well, you're visual, being visual now, this is ridiculous. Or everyone said, this is ridiculous, you should get more. And I did get more by the second series, I think. How much? I don't know, about 300 grand. And <laughs> no, don't be so stupid. <laughs> but you were originally paid 260 quid an episode. Triangular video. That's outrageous, that's more than I was paid. That's what Ed got for series, mate. Oh, where the hell are you? What hell happened? Right, I am getting on to my lawyer now. Yeah, right. You're, 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 you're a lawyer, Ed. I'm going to... Hello! Levine and Levine! <laughs> uh, got, they're uh, at, they're, uh, they're, they're hey. saying um, coconut oil, would, had you run out of dog's milk? <laughs> now, so this, what we're looking at now, Norman, is, is the conversation between you and Gordon, the man with the awesome intellect, yeah, he um, was. He was uh, this is Gordon Salkild, who was in um, uh, Wrinkles with David Ross. So it's not a coincidence his name is Gordon. Oh. We precast him. And in a, many ways, he was kind of the model for uh, the character he played in our radio sitcom, was kind of a model for Holly in the end. There was a very topical moment there where Gordon couldn't turn off his screen which is something that has happened with a lot of people with zoom and they leave it. that awkward zoom. moment when you think you've left and you're just looking at the zoom, zoom embarrassment i think we, we call, call it, it zoom, zoom embarrassment we call it he had a session there that joke's been used so many times in comedy hasn't it since yeah so yeah, yeah imagine turning this off well, you know always it ends like nice gag about the first move though norman yeah finish the scene you, you finish the scene with a top gag there about it being the first move and now they're going through all the mail yeah. We had a question, of, did, did Holly ever, what was Holly's response? I, I think you responded, prawny to King's Bishop 37. I think that was your move. Yeah, something. <coughs> it was. I I remember now. Ed, there's a question here which I don't really understand, but talking about using a different actor in the remastered episodes, is that right? Yeah, I believe so. The, uh, Gordon was recast. I, I can't tell you why. I don't know whether it was a, a contractual or technical reason or whether it was an artistic one, but somebody else played that part. So they reshot those scenes and dropped them in? Wasn't you? Yeah, yeah I, I honestly don't, I couldn't tell you why. I, I, I think he was pretty good myself, but yeah. Braun takes horsey, absolutely. Braun takes horsey, Danny, that's exactly right. I hope that did it was as thick as could be. He was great, he was brilliant. Thick, best actor for doing thick men ever. Yeah, Gordon Selkill was great. Maybe somebody could answer this. Was it rewritten? Was the dialogue the same? Yeah, they just got someone else. It wasn't, I can't remember, you were younger. And, and I thought, what are we doing in this? You know, mm. and, it, and in the I'd end, love to know it, who made that decision and why. That's interesting. I just love the concept of playing postal chess 300 <laughs> million years into the future and they're on their yeah. first move. It's just a funny game. Yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, as, as was the dog's milk and all those uh, sort of jokes and Tottenham Hotspur and all. <laughs> of Tottenham, that is steaming pile of whatever. Oh, this is a, this is a great kind of porridgey scene. Yeah. It's so this when, is, uh, uh, Lister can't quite read Rimmer's father's handwriting. But his brother's really handwriting. That, that his dad's dead, but he can't read it properly. That is, it's interesting, is isn't it? Because you've got a wonderful porridgey like scene, a, 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 an odd couple type scene, in the first episode that suddenly explodes those four walls and walks out into the real world. I, I think this script is very important for that reason that in a moment we're about to go through the door and, and find ourselves in a different world. Yeah. Hiya, Evie Parsons. She's eight. She's joining us for the first time. Well, Evie, it's lovely to have you, but we need to be on our best, better manners, possibly, if Evie's with us. 
<laughs> Try and behave ourselves, Was there an Spurs joke going in there? Oh, oh, we're into a football row. Uh oh. No, someone wasn't a. Oh, no, keep off the football, guys. <laughs> football row, look out. Football and politics. <laughs> yeah, that can cause a lot of problems. <laughs> Danny Stevenson. So this is a um, oh, this yeah. is a triumph of model work and chroma key. This is the observation tower. And you see Rimmer looking mournful at the top. And there's a shot, I think, here. You can see Craig making his way up there. So it's a chroma key on model. Nice angle on that. I'm not sure where we shot that bit. And then he joins him up the top. Yeah. Hi, Joe. We see four-week-old Holly is watching. It's amazing to think you've already got a four-week-old baby who was born quite a long way into these shows. So. Well, yeah. Shows she, you how long we've been doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope she stays awake this time. <laughs> oh, and she doesn't fill a nappy twice like she did last time. That's... So, Ed, was that the only time we went up on the observation deck in your, in your time? Uh, I think we did go up again later on. Um, One more and time, yeah. We did. Uh, we, uh, because we Howard's died. music, though, eh? Was yeah, that... Howard's music there was really terrific. It sets the mood. Um, because although this is very funny dialogue, it's quite a, a, a speech full of pathos, really, from this. <laughs> and again, Rob and I were discussing this earlier, it, there's <laughs> times like this when you look back at how well they performed this and you kind of think, this was really, really good. Because at the time, obviously, you're really worried about, are the line going to work? Are the shots going to work? Is this going to work? Is that going to work? Are we going to be able to cut this together? You know, how's it looking? Is the spacing right? And all the little things you worry about. And then the perform how good their performance is only really dawns on you. You're so you right, Ed. You know, I just say it again, and including with Norman here, the five of them, we were so lucky. We cast these five people. I, we just they, didn't realise. We uh, didn't realise how good they were. To be absolutely honest with you, we didn't realise how good they were. And you look back on these episodes now, there's some brilliant acting work going on here. Uh, I love getting up on the observation deck. It takes us somewhere completely different, Ed, and just starts to open this. Yeah, episode. that was that was the th the thinking behind it. Just because we're, we're all in this kind of prison most of the time, and it's. it's no, I read for Rimmer, didn't don't you? We do, yeah. Norman. We, we try to forget it, Norman. And it I read the, moment. The, the bloke was who read for Lister was that little bloke. Um, he does a lot of Cockneys. I can't remember his name now, but he was he was he was very good actually, and he's oh. quite little as well because it was in. Like Craig's little, isn't he? <laughs> Don't quote him on that. <laughs> little but powerful. I'm trying to think who that would be, Paul. Any idea? He's very powerful, yeah. Lee Corns? Oh, no, not Phil Daniels. No, no. Oh, God, sorry. Phil. David Jason. No. <laughs> There's a lot of. David Jason. No, it wasn't David Jason. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he was. Uh, he did Cockney parts and he was, uh, he was really. Ronnie good. Corbett, no. <laughs> Bob Hoskins, no, it would have been lovely to have any of these people, but Tom Cruise, that's it. Tom Cruise, correct. Tom Cruise, well done. Ray Winston. That's it. Ray Winston. And outline revenue will. I'm just answering some questions here. With... <laughs> Danny Dyer. No, this was 30 years ago, guys. <laughs> Eddie Lard, Brad Pitt, yeah, very good. Chris Barnard Ryan. Castle, I think, came in for it, didn't he? Danny DeVito. Didn't Barnard Castle come in for it? Yes, Barnard. Arnold Castle, he was a very good actor. But he couldn't read the script clearly. That he was... couldn't because his eyesight, he had yeah, trouble with his eyesight. Shit. I tell you, all these are great situations, but sadly none of them are right. <laughs> You're interested. Well, I think we're losing it now, boys. Yeah, you'll have to think, Norman, otherwise this will go on forever. Timothy Chalamet, no, I don't think so. Norman, Ed, you... Ed, you introduced me to Ronnie Corbett, do you remember? Say again? You introduced me to Ronnie Corbett. He was in your office. Do you remember? Oh, right. I'm glad I did that. Norman and, yeah. he, and it turned out he didn't. He hated me because I swear I kept swearing. He didn't like. He didn't like uh, bad language. He was a. He was a. Dear he friend. actually he used was a bugger for that. He, he didn't <laughs> like language. He really didn't. He was a lovely, lovely man. By David way. Wallace is asking: Did the gazpacho soup scene from the end of season, series one give us more confidence? In giving Lister, yes, more of those. Now, this was a real newsreader you're looking at here, ladies and No expense spared. We went for authenticity. She's a real newsreader of the time, Ed. I didn't realise. Yeah, I'd seen the Jenkins. Yeah. And she was extremely good. Yeah. Although everything on her costume, or certainly on my Amazon version, seems to be breaking up and chroma keying very badly. But I think it's a sign of the times that those shoulder pads, I think, Oh my God! I need to place this thing straight back thirty years. Howard. Norman, could you see and hear the other actors they're asking, which is important because, of course, it's all to do with the timing. So, just explain how you experienced the show. 
Oh, you're asking me a question? Yes, <laughs> you're asking Norman. That's here's it. the key. Norman, <laughs> could you explain? Uh, um, they're asking, could you see and hear the other actors when you were performing? Could I see them? Yeah, on a little screen, yeah. I asked for a little screen and I got it. So you yes, saw so Norman was always normally tucked away, weren't you, Norm, behind the back of the set? Way right around the back. Well, the, the fact is, when we did the new uh, the special, I was sat right at the front. And the whole audience could see me reading the altar cue and everything. And you were very distracting, Norman, and it would never happen again. <laughs> no, 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 I want to be there. It's at the front. It's nice. It's Honestly, nice. Norman would rather that he played Rimmer. Let's be honest. I mean, this whole thing is working slowly towards <laughs> Rimmer the moment Rimmer when Rimmer's Rimmer destroyed and Holly comes out and plays it. I could never play uh, played Rimmer. As soon as I was reading it, I thought, I can't do this. I, I think part of the mystique, though, when, when we touch you behind a set or was that nobody could see that you weren't really just ahead, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think the trouble, Norman, is you are innately very funny and sticking you in front of the audience, you'd be upstaging everybody the whole time. <laughs> well, I didn't. That, yeah, that was a, a, an interesting moment where the cat actually tries to console Remy and does it badly, <laughs> but... Fails. It is, he's integrating more into the uh, group. He's becoming more human, isn't he, in this series? He starts yeah. to have emotions and he starts to relate to the other two guys. And we're about to go outdoors now, and this is where there is quite a few technical, not <laughs> errors, but um, moments that I'm not terribly proud of. <laughs> we start off coming out of some smoke, which is fine. That's in the studio with a pair of, this is like a runway that we built in the studio, and they nicely went under the, under the camera, but. Uh, but Lister had to duck to avoid hitting his head on the camera. This shot of a door is also in the studio, um, so it looks all right. And now we're on to Real Beach. And we're on Real but Beach. Yeah. Behind them, in the background, you can see some trees and <laughs> a field, which we haven't seen before at all. And it was dark when they went through the door. Now it's daylight in the background. But apart from that, it's flawless. Well, this this was in the script, it said, a beach in paradise. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, these days, of course, it would be a piece of cake to go to a grade, uh, to a grade. As, as Rob would and I'd be able to you. turn all of this into looking like the Caribbean in seconds. But in those days, there was no such thing as grading. So we had to go with what we got, which was this. <laughs> and there was a scene we had to cut, wasn't there, Ed? Because um, uh, Danny was in a deck chair yeah. drinking this huge cocktail. Absolutely, and it was... Um, but he, he was actually was, shaking. <laughs> we couldn't do anything. He was shaking so much, he couldn't actually get the lines out, so we had to cut it. So it when you wrote... It, it's so windy that, that, that Chris's tie got blown over his shoulder, so we had to do <laughs> it like that. When you wrote Paradise, Rob, what were you hoping in your deep recess of your mind? Where were you hoping to be flown to, to shoot? I don't know, somewhere with sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> so not real? <laughs> not real. Actually, I bet it's very sunny and lovely and real today. If anybody the thing is, because, because we're from Manchester. Yes, here comes Tony Hawkes. Because we were from Manchester, we, wearing a wig. we all went to uh, Wales for our holidays anyway, so it wasn't exactly exotic for us. So, Norman, remind me, you're in this, <laughs> you're in this exterior location. Did you come to Real with us, or did we shoot your bits separately and then drop them in? I, I, came, I came to Real. It was, it was you came my, to Real. See, there you go. The mastery of technology, even though he doesn't actually appear in any of the locations, we took him to the location and shot him probably in the back of a truck, I would imagine, Norm. Yeah, in the back yeah, of a truck. I like to keep him in the back Which of a truck. I mean, if you think about it, how crazy is that? Bringing an actor all the way to Real to sit in the back of a truck. To, I mean, to the face black. <laughs> you just normally wouldn't, you wouldn't do that nowadays. So you robbed you broke these cars. I couldn't get some of the cars to appear on the beach. One of them was a dinky toy. I can't tell you which one. I think it was the uh, Robin the Reliant. And um, we eventually managed to get this E-Type to roll off, but it was a nightmare. Ah, Macruda. Oh, yeah. She does this really well, actually, I thought. Yeah. She's, she's, she's great, this girl. Well, I can't remember her name, but she was really great. I'm not quite sure what the significance of Dave Benson Phillips is, but he's obviously a very important character who got in the back of shot or was watching this being filmed. Were you aware, Ed? Of the he's presence the of guy with the um, invisible dog, isn't he? I don't know. He's Apparently he's very important. Yeah, there, there, we managed to get the car to go, thank God. 
Yes, I was wondering. Uh, I'm just going to show you. I thought he was going to get stuck in the sand there. Did he ever have revving and not able to move? On that soft sand, I'm amazed he got it away. I got yeah. some pictures from um, Curtis uh, Threadgold of Sasha. So what we're looking at on the on your show, no. on the show, is the same place here that Rob's showing you the location, and it looks almost exactly the same. <laughs> it hasn't actually been redecorated in thirty years. Apparently, these photographs Rob's showing you, this photograph Rob's showing, you, is current, is recent. So, oh, Seb, if you want to relive better than life. You can go there now. Well, in a few days, obviously. Those chairs look good, look new. Curtis Threadgold, are you there? Curtis Threadgold. Just looking in the chat. Okay, so when are these photos taken, man? Rob, I can't see the chat line because you've taken over my you picture. Take that picture Thank down. Thank you very much. much. Complaints department, isn't it? <laughs> this is great as a little fish. <laughs> She was an aquarium. Well, you just said hello, Curtis Threadgold. But when did you take he the picture? It's still the same. It's still the same, he said. So. About seven years ago, those pics. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, so it hadn't changed in 20. Wait, now, talk to us about Magruder, Ed. Who's the actress playing the that? Ship's wheel is still on the wall, Seb oh, says. Well, sorry. She's very good, though. She's lovely. I wouldn't want to get her name wrong, so I'm not sure. This Sorry, sequence where the cat orders live goldfish to eat, it almost borders on the distasteful. Not quite, but nearly. <laughs> I was delighted with it. So, Rob, just talk to us about the moment in the writing process between one and two when you made a decision to get out of the, uh, the uh, capsule you, you'd created for yourselves. That was a big decision, I presume. Well, no, it was just the opportunity was there. And, and you know, this was our first uh, self-penned uh, TV series. So it was, you know, such an adventure to be able to go and shoot outside. Um, so we, we just made the most of it, really. Uh, but we, we only obviously had a limited number of uh, days we could do it, weren't there? In, uh, a How many days were you on Real Beach? We uh, were on one day. A day. I, and, and did the uh, golf as well that same day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and, and presumably the scene with all the kids, with Magruder and all the kids. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, I think we did a lot in a day. We certainly didn't stay at real. I know, oh, you didn't do all that in a day, Ed. Come on. We travelled back, I guess. That is face there. It's priceless when, when Craig's downing the Dom Perignon in one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a pint of Dom Perignon. Of Judy girl. Hawkins played Magruder, Ed. <laughs> ah, thank you. Judy Hawkins. You. Oh, yeah. This is full. This is full on Rimmer. Not actually being able to say something funny, but no, it's not a yeah. set, don't he? This but is... again, there's a lovely idea behind this whole storyline that that even with a game about better than life, where everybody goes to to experience their best possible life, Rimmer experiences tragedy. I mean, it's a yeah, lovely it's idea. It's a real class story, and of course, uh, turned into pretty much a whole novel spanning two novels. Um, uh, I think this credit to the, the earlier scene to the costume department for the aliens that we, I think, look pretty good all sitting around and eating. And that was obviously stolen from Star Wars uh, to have lots of aliens sitting around and eating. Tracy's saying Rimmer is the uh, creator of his, the master of his own failure, which is so true. I mean, he just, but not only he brings the other two down as well. So the yeah. other two are having this wonderful experience and he screws it all up. I'm standing, by the way. Uh, I read the first novel, uh, but I haven't read the subsequent ones. Just being asked. The, the guys are saying that uh, Better Than Life is a much darker experience in the novels, Rob. Is yeah, right? because you've got much uh, longer to explore it. I mean, to, to get this story basically in 20 minutes is uh, uh, really compact. Moment <laughs> of here, when Craig first hit that golf shot in a slightly unusual baseball stance, it was about the 18th go he had before he actually managed to hit the ball. And yet he claimed... And Craig hadn't really played golf before, ever. He claimed he was a regular golfer. Oh, yeah, he did, didn't he? I he said, oh, yeah, and no, I play all the time. Pass me a bit of gag there where Danny throws the golf club instead of the ball. Robert, you're so right. The more he talks about his family, the more we understand why he's this twisted, hmm. fundamentally sad 
human being. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of psychological understanding on the part of the writers that they create this character Look, and explain so... him through his own words, you know? He hates himself. He hates himself, but so badly that even in this game, he can't resist ruining it all. So Danny and uh, Craig were working very well together. They're doing a lot of synchronous stuff, little moves that they do together. It's just a sort of little things they do and they work together. And here comes Norman on his mobile trolley. Yo! No. With a, uh, a handkerchief on top of the trolley. A, a, a kerchief over, your, over the top of the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Good justification for dragging you up to real, Norman, so you yeah, could be I, on that monitor, which yeah, couldn't I've be seen, done any other way. I've seen this mer inverted mermaid gag ripped off several right. times, including in the series that Craig did. The um, reverse mermaid is just such a brilliant idea, isn't it? I mean, everybody envisaged it the other way around, obviously. <laughs> and then she no, it's not, it was fun, Norm, but getting that piece of machinery to get you into the golf game, the amount of trouble we had to do with the remote control trolley that didn't work, wouldn't move properly, fell apart, but it was worth it to get you in there. So Andy, you're saying the Better Than Life, the second book is insanely funny. So given I'm not very well up on the novels which is the book i really really have to read guys of the novels which is the one that is a must read even funny guy apparently the omnibus funny guy did the i agree i there. agree that's the which that's one the, the omnibus of the first oh right okay <laughs> um it is brilliant all the little kids in sailors outfits yeah i love that i love that. Really really all those kids from apparently ed you reshot that because the weather was so bad on the first shoot yeah you're right, and, you and also, back on a better day. I was so pleased with his tweed jacket. <laughs> he looks, and I love this two shot coming up where you just see the desperation. Help! Bang, he's turned into a bum. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, it's, and it's, it's, it's an interesting book, that Lister could wear anything, but chooses to exactly wear whatever yeah. he was doing. <laughs> yeah, he could be dressed in the high Now, this actor's name, I'm guessing, um, tell me if I'm right, gang, Ron Pember. Yeah, yeah. Um, we used him in Young Ones, I think, Ed. We certainly worked with yeah. him before. Certainly worked with him in the Young Ones. He was far too convincing a Cockney Heavy for my liking. <laughs> he was, uh, he was you know, a clear. very serious proper actor, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, they're saying Family Guy used the reverse mermaid gag, so uh, you started now, something in your voice. Um, coming up is one of my favourite shots. You've all seen this, so you know what's coming up. He's, uh, they wind up and up to their next buried in sand. So yeah. we really did dig out the sand and put the three actors in there and Norman's trolley and stuck him in there as well. And they were genuinely dug that deep into the sand, Ed. They were, yeah. they were you know, not standing in a pit, surely. They were, they, and we dug it down so you could kneel, but right. it looked like obviously they'd... And then um, and we dug uh, Norman's um, trolley halfway in there as well. And the, <laughs> the gag I really like about this, here's the shot is you've got them up to the next and you cut to Norman in a minute and he's also got jam smeared all over his head. For what possible reason? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I love the hanky, and the hanky on the telly. It's just lovely. Come on to one of my favourite shots of the location. This time, it really, we did manage to get a good shot. Which well, was is the hanky on the... That shot there, the angled four shot. On the monitor, yeah. Was that, was that written in or was that a thought on set? No, I think that's just something we, uh, we jammed on the... Do you know, that's what I love when you get out on location and everybody's, maybe an AFM or a costume person said, why don't you put a hanky over his head? I mean, I love it. A knotted hanky on his head. Oh my God, this, what's that machine, Ed? There's like a, is it a game machine? An arcade machine? What is it? Uh, where are we? We're in, uh, well, in Nivello 346. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a video game, you know, is it? Did we put something in there to hint that we were still we in the game? Maybe. I, maybe. Maybe. So Molly's, Molly's asking, well, what, what is it with you and tarantulas? They seem to be... I, I, I don't even know that's a thing. It's also it evil. evil. Whenever something's horrible, it's tarantulas. I have to say, this end shot here was inspiratory for almost even... every end frame I ever did on bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Freeze on violence, fabulous. So there we go, uh, guys, quite a, quite a distinctive episode. I mean, an episode that really rewrites the rules in so many ways. You must have been very pleased, to both Rob and Ed, when you'd finished it. Well, I, I mean, when, when did you ever get a sitcom with a story like that? Before? No. It's well, just... I know, it was, really, it was really fun. I have to say, it was quite tricky shooting that stuff, the exterior stuff, 
conscious all the time that everything's going to look a bit ordinary when it's really supposed to look very spectacular. But the story was so strong that in the end, the visuals, even if they didn't quite match up to what I wanted, really didn't matter because the story just pulled it through. Oh, absolutely. You know, everybody knew, you know, the state of the art. And when I used to watch Blake 7, and it was completely unconvincing, but you get lost when you're a sci-fi fan. You know, you don't get your fix often. Enough. I think it looks, you know, I think you're beating yourself up, Ed. I think there's enough great visual gags in yeah, there. Yeah, and you're really cutting edge with it. <laughs> it's really working. Well, thank you. you. Obviously, right. I was just fishing for that. No, it is true, Ed. You know, I mean, I have to say it. You, you um, Jez Harrison, I, what inspired the use of Esperanto in Red Dwarf? We, we spoke about this before. It was indeed the stainless steel rat novels of, uh, well, it was Harry Harrison in general. It was a tribute to him because he was a big uh, Esperantino name. Um, Ed, you worked with um, Norman again uh, later on the Ruby shows, didn't you, with some interesting uh, effects? Yes, we, we uh, Ruby did a show for Channel 4 and, and Norman was the uh, was a sort of floor manager slash co-host, I so think would be the sort of loose way of describing it. Is that right? Is that fair? It's both floor manager. Yeah. Musical. And there's two favourite moments. I mean, there were many great moments in it. One of my favourite moments is that Ruby says... Um, uh, we, and now for my next guest, Emma Thompson. And Norman comes on and goes, she's not coming. And Ruby says, why? She goes, she doesn't like you. <laughs> Just hang on, do that for us now. And my next guest, coming to you now, Norman, and my next guest is <laughs> Emma Thompson. Not coming. Why is that? It doesn't like you. See, he makes it funny. Do you see how he does that? <laughs> you know he did that and I didn't. He makes it funny. <laughs> see? Uh, and it's his job, is it? It's his job, isn't it? It's his another another time, um, we were filming in a dungeon, uh, a, a sex dungeon, um, with a woman called Lady St. Clair, also known as Miss Whiplash, and we couldn't think how to finish the sequence in a funny way. And then it was a real. This was a real dominatrix dungeon. Real dominatrix, yeah, yeah real thing. I couldn't think of the best way to come up with it. And then. Um, we came up with the brilliant, well, Ruby came up with the brilliant idea that we discover Norman <laughs> inside a very small cage, enjoying being locked up. <laughs> In a gimp mask. In a gimp mask, Ed, or not? Uh, no, I was in the gimp mask. But yeah, so why I, were you in the gimp mask? Because the man in the gimp mask refused to be in the gimp mask. And so and some he was a genuine gimp mask guy who yeah. didn't come along. So I had to dress up in it, and then Ruby dressed me up in the gimp mask. Is it right up to here? She interviewed me and then obviously left and left me lying there because I was tied up. I had, obviously, I had hang Now, there are a large number of people, Ed, asking where they can see this show. It's, uh, I think, it was Don't Miss Wax, wasn't it, Norm? Yeah. yeah. Don't Miss Wax. Don't Miss Wax. Uh, I can't remember which episode. You just have to look it up. But it's the one with um, uh, Miss Whiplash or Lindy St. Clair, she was called. Was it? We had a brothel in a, in a dungeon in... In Notting Hill Gate. In Fulham. It was one series, yeah. isn't it, on a Friday night when it on Channel 4? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, we did more than one series there, didn't we? Yeah. Two yeah. series, I think. Yeah, did you? You went in the first series, I think, Norm. You came in in the second series as floor manager. To save it. Yeah, you yeah. Exactly. To save it. It, was, it was wobbling. It was wobbling, Norm. Exactly. And, so, Norm, did you try out any of the kit when you were in Miss Whiplash? I know. I didn't try out need for that. I know my, I know my own sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually quite famous at the time because she rented that flat yeah. from the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont. Yeah. And so there'd been a big tabloid news story, which is why Ruby wanted to get hold of her, yeah. that Miss Whiplash ran this dungeon in a, in a flat which was owned by Norman Lamont. But I'm so pleased that we managed to get Norman into the, into the brothel torture chamber for me. <laughs> High moment of career. And indeed yourself into a gimp mask, Ed, pretending to be a gimp mask fanatic. You know, you have to do things sometimes, Paul, just for the good of the show. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, it's false reporting, Ed. For the virus. Um, Nick Hopkins is asking me, uh, oh. said, uh, Rob, Doug tweeted today that you once wrote a radio sitcom pilot for Michael Angelis called Blue Moon. Uh, Still Michael Angelis, sadly, we, would, uh, we would never write anything called Blue Moon. Anyone who knows anything about Manchester United and Manchester City <laughs> would go nowhere near it. It was okay. called Blue Skies and it had um, Emma Thompson in it as well. Yeah. Except she didn't want to do it because she doesn't like you. This is referencing obviously that Paul Mike, Michael Angelis has died. Um, I worked with him a few times. He was really, really one of the most charming men I've ever met. He was. and so funny. Forrest, I did do a show called 
uh, Hal Honey, I'm Home, which was about uh, Hitler. <laughs> so you did. <laughs> and their next door neighbours, a Jewish couple who lived next door to them. Um, it never saw the light of day. Uh, we recorded about five or six episodes for B Sky uh. B, and when Sky bought B Sky B in the middle of recording, it was stopped immediately. And in fact, I thought all the episodes had been burned, but I was at a conference in Canada a couple of years ago, and somebody said to me, no, no, it's on YouTube. You can see the first episode is on YouTube. And I don't know if it still is, but if it is, have a look. It's a very strange show. Very strange. B Sky B wanted a show that would get them publicity, which it did, in fact, get them a lot of publicity, but not a lot of viewers, because they never showed it. Um, can you, for uh, Evie's, the eight-year-old's benefit, explain what a brothel is, Paul? Uh, a brothel is a, a house where uh, people go to, to, get soup. to party and enjoy themselves. Have soup, broth. Broth? <laughs> broth, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like a little broth. Yeah, they, they sell broth. Oh, I see. Sell broth, a broth L, yeah. Right. Yes, it's like a, it's a, a party house. Uh, Alphabetty yeah. soup, broth with just L's in it. <laughs> it's like a soup kitchen, yeah. It's like a soup kitchen, yeah. <laughs> Only with people in gimp masks. Yeah. Okay, well, um, can we just ask uh, at the end uh, for everyone, because we were all very worried about you, Norm, and uh, you are looking very well, even though you're only 23. Um, <laughs> It looks like it's taking it out of you a bit. Um, we're, we're, we're not... <laughs> but, seven, but the other way round. What, what was it like? What was it like? Was it um, frightening when you had it? Were you worried? Um, well, I was very confused and uh, I just took it in my stride, really. And, but I was confused, very confused. But uh, uh, confusion's always been part of me anyway. Uh, the way I talk and people say that. But, uh, and how's it been uh, recovering once you're out uh, of the office? Well, when I got back, I could hardly walk and, you know, uh, I say hardly walk, I couldn't walk very far because I'd be a bit breathless and, and I had no appetite at all. And I, I hardly ate anything per day. Lost some weight. The weeks went by, I started to eat more and I did walks every day and I got better and, uh, you know, I'm pretty much... I'm pretty much back, uh, you know, to what I was. You're then. you're indestructible, Norm. As the guys are saying, you are indestructible. Well, I've been very lucky. I always think, you know, that having that heart attack at 39, that was before I got married and had my beautiful daughters, and before I did Red Dwarf, it could have been all over then. And, <laughs> and I'm so grateful that you know the way it's gone. It's it, and I'm very happy as a person. For well, I say very happy. Uh, Part of me is very happy inside. But I, so, I have you got any any tips for anyone who um, finds <laughs> themselves with the symptoms? Well, it's, it's scary for us. We don't. Well, I, there's all sorts of symptoms. As a, my, mine was a, a, a cough, a continuing cough that I had for some time, and uh, and a bit of breathing problems. You know, weren't breathing properly, and there's all sorts of things. You know, there's a, the taste thing. And the smell, you know, if you can't smell anything or you can't taste any food, then that you've got a problem there. You should go and get that looked at. There's lots of things, but I, I think this disease, disease, uh, I think this will, there's, lot, there's a lot more to, yeah. I, I don't like to bring bad news, but I've got things, there's a, lot, there's a long way to go yet, you know, a long way to go. Before. I think we don't really know the half of it yet, Norm, do we? That's the trouble. Uh, uh, and it really annoys me when I, I bumped into people and they're all arguing about who, where it came from. Did it come from the bats, the Chinese or whatever? I, I said, forget that. Just, you know, just get well. Talk about looking after yourself and being well. They'll find out what, where it started and, what, you know, what do you want to know? At the moment, it's not the pressing issue, is it, really? The well, pressing everyone issue. thinks they're an expert. And, uh, it's where it's going, not where it's been yeah they're saying they trust you norm of course because you have an iq of six thousand. so you well you're... they did come to me on a lot of occasions <laughs> yeah you wouldn't say i said no i suggested they took a tablespoon full of disinfectant every morning <laughs> you know, and then of course trump jumped on that didn't trump he jumped. picked it up from you norm obviously that's a joke evie that's not true they had to put warnings on all the stuff to I, know. Do this. I know the debt old company had to put out a warning i mean how insane but people will do that there's, there's some stupid people out there okay so ed um do you have any advice uh for our homies yes i do um some of you may have noticed that my hair is shorter this is because i cut my own hair 
Now, the way I did this is I have a beard trimmer to trim this. If you see, this has got a little bit longer. Good the reason beard. that is that while I was doing all this, it worked very successfully. You have to brush downwards along with the, the direction of your hair. Yeah. And then you don't think it's working, but hair keeps falling off and everything. And so I got down to here and I thought, brilliant. Now I'll just tick, trim my beard. And it got stuck. Oh. And I had to disengage it and pull it out. Oh. I broke my, my razor on my hair, which I should have been using for this. So my advice is, if you're going to do this, do it once. It's a good job you weren't doing that on your groinal attachment. Can you imagine trying to get that free of it? <laughs> You're right. It was my next thing on the list. I don't want to know anymore. I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> Paul, Paul, so uh, what, where do you reckon, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, we're up two and a half months into this uh, lockdown and they are talking uh, basically about releasing everybody simultaneously this week, as far as I can see. And it sounds like a mad idea to me. Yeah. Um, do you do you think they're doing the right thing? Are you? I did, I kind of go back to what I said two weeks ago, Rob. I think it's down to each individual. I do think it's down to people to use their common sense, and I don't mean in the coming sense of that word, as a ridiculous excuse. But I think in the end, we don't know enough about this virus. I think we went into lockdown on the basis of an extraordinarily unsupportable, in my opinion, lunatic prediction from Mr. Ferguson of half a million deaths. I think they were panicked by the crisis at Northwick Park and they suddenly thought that the National Health Service was, was gonna be overwhelmed. Uh, and I think they made a bad decision. I think they know they made a bad decision. I think their problem now is they don't know how to get out of it. So I would say to you, without being silly, without tearing the pants off it, as the, as the scientific advisor said the other day, do what you feel comfortable with, do what you feel safe with. I'm just about this second to walk up to the common at the top of my road and meet my grandson for the first time in 11 weeks. And if he comes running up to me and hugs me, I'm gonna give him a hug, I have to tell you. And it's not even Monday when we're supposed to be meeting him. So I'm not saying ignore it all, uh, but I think they don't really understand this, this virus. Yeah. I don't think they know about it. By oh. the way, those, those uh, models were based on general predictions around the world's health services that this uh, disease had something like 30, 40, 30 to, three to four percent mortality rate. If you got it, Three to four percent of you died. The American Disease was, uh, for Center for Disease Control uh, on Thursday published the actual numbers based on the American experience, which is 0.4 percent of people who've got it have died. So that calculation was 90 percent wrong, and it's on that basis. That this is this is the died. thing I think, Paul. I've told I, we said right from the start. One, this is a pandemic. It's never happened before. There is no such thing as an expert because. You can't be an expert in something that hasn't happened. That's like being a unicorn trainer. It's just mad. Um, the people, uh, the predictions we made are based on computer models. Since the turn of the century, the British Scientific Journal has refused to publish papers based on computer modeling because you need to get absolutely every single datum correct um, going in. You need to uh, know exactly what to ask that uh, data and you, Otherwise, if you get one of those little elements wrong, well, if, you use one base number that's ninety percent out. out. What comes out the other end is mathematical diarrhea. So look, that's guys, that's guys. what we're basing our policy on. Um, we don't know. I, I'm I'm terrified that you know we go out and and then uh, we get another lockdown that's even worse and even longer. I'm I'm keeping my distance uh, and and and. Um, because there's a lot of mad bastards out there. Sorry, Evie. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I take being the devil's advocate slightly is that on Monday you're allowed to see six other people. Uh, there's a group of six, uh, and some of those other people can be from another household. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of not going to do any more than that um, because I think if it's an excuse for everybody to meet, get together. And so guys, yeah, Mike, I would be, I would feel bad about that. And you know, Norm can say from experience, this isn't a pleasant disease to get. Oh, it's not. So I would really keep your distance, Gary. Yeah, really I'm not advocating going wild and tearing the pants out of it. As I say, mm -hmm. I do think that's right, but I do think you have to use your common sense. And I do think that the government have so terrified the entire population that if we're not careful, we will never go back to work, and then we'll all die of poverty anyway. So. There's got to be a point at which we start to get on the front foot with this disease. And I think that the government currently don't know how to do it. That's what I think. Okay. 
Here's an interesting fact that in, it was in the private eye in, in, in the week there was a TV show and it had been uh, cut at the last minute and there's a very strange edit at the end of the show with two men are talking, then they, you cut back to the studio and it's like a jump. And it turns out they cut out the shaking hands at the end. <laughs> That's become taboo. Mm. Um, so I think this is changing things. And I do think, you know, guys, if you've not seen your loved ones in two and a half months, Try and do it this week safely because... Long that's a very good point, Rob, because that's one of the reasons why I'm going up to meet Archie now, because who knows by next weekend if we'll be allowed to do it. And to be very clear, Ed, if we're not allowed to do it, I won't do it. That's absolutely correct. I'm not suggesting you just bust the rules. OK, but... yeah, well, we're not a political show, but no. um, yes, did you all see SpaceX launch? Yes. That's thrilling. That's... That is, and to think that we're doing that, and look, suddenly the news has got other items in it that are not about COVID. I mean, in the next, tomorrow we're going to have horse racing. Within a couple of weeks, we'll have football. You've got the SpaceX thing. We've got other things happening in the news, and I think we need that desperately. That's an exciting development. This species has to get off this planet and out of this solar system, frankly. Well, I think right. this species has to move on, uh, and we're not going to do you think we're the Mars norm? Is that your plan? Sorry? Are you going to take a trip to Mars if you've got a chance? No, I can't. I'm too busy. <laughs> okay, guys. So How listen, <laughs> uh, just a quick one. I know Rob doesn't like asking for money on this show, and we don't ask for money. But just to say that the Just Giving site is now just a couple of hundred pounds short of the target of 2,500. We normally only ask for that on the, uh, on the lockdown theatre reads, but we are just 200 short of our target. So it'd be lovely if we could uh, top that up again, if anybody feels like giving a couple of quid. Uh, next week, we are going slightly out of order we're staying in series two but we're going to jump to Queeg, i think guys is that right yeah yeah so again we'll have a special guest with us uh which we'll announce on the day but we're delighted and very excited that we've got a guest to join us for Queeg. um norman i just want to say a big thank you to you it's fantastic to see you especially after what you've been through but a funny funny man mr norman lovett thank you norman <laughs> norman Norm, any, I wanted to ask, any particular memories from the dwarf that you'd like to share with the... Throat now. Norman's just coughing in his elbow. <laughs> Sorry, I got something. Yeah, Sorry, I just wanted to ask, any memories what? of Red Dwarf that you want to share that you can think of that would be fun? No, nah, not really. <laughs> classic, classic Norm. And what about some advice? I believe that you uh, have advice about bum yes. putting your hair cut. I mean, I'm, I do my own hair and I have done for some time with a uh, clipper thing. I, I, I've only had a beard once when I was 25. I grew a beard, I had it for a week and I shaved it off. I said, well, oh, I'm never having one of those, but I, I just don't like beards. But beards do, you've got a nice beard there, Ed. That's good. It's a good beard. It suits you. Well done. And uh, a lot of blokes do have beards and look all right, but it's not for me. But cutting your hair, yeah, you've got to cut your hair. And also you haven't got to put up with talking to a barber. You know, uh, sorry, that's an old-fashioned word for hairdresser. <laughs> got, you know, anything for the weekend, sir? Been anywhere nice? And all that. Been, been anywhere nice? Yeah, Mark. Been anywhere nice. Going, where, where are you going for your holidays? Where are you going for your no holidays? No fucking where. That's <laughs> where. Aberystwyth, you know. Aberystwyth. Well, you'd be lucky. You're not allowed into Wales, Norman. You, can't, you couldn't have filmed in Royal Beach this week, Ed. No. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I've got you're a right. couple of... Uh, things i need to ask a thanks to the uh, web team our fabulous web team and uh, the fan club dudes who help us shelly and joe and everyone um uh, if you uh, saw um uh, lockdown theater uh felicity montague and olivia her daughter are doing the mother daughter manual i'm just on chat now going to put up a link to that podcast there you go and i've got two things for you uh this week um just getting the other one okay uh two gifts this is the first one it's um an ian e. foster short story that uh it was the second short story that turned me on to science fiction when i was 12. the first one was the star by arthur c clark and the machine stops i quoted it to paul the other day and he thought i was talking about brave new world because uh, he hadn't read it um this is really about now, and that's a free link to. Um, Where's that, Rob? Yeah. The machine stops. That, from me. From, Got it. Um, so check that out. It's a fantastic story. And uh, as soon as 
this started happening i thought oh my god ian foster um and the other one the other gift is i'm going to give you a lot of time but you have to work for it if you in any way use a keyboard take a course this week to learn how to touch type and you'll go from 20 words a minute to 40 or 50 words a minute very good alison it's true isn't it i mean it's, it will save you about half your working life it's and you can do it online just simply on a course online uh, Rob, there yeah. were loads of free ones maybe beacons pretty good um but there's loads of free ones online i learned from a book called uh, touch typing made simple i learned in five days two hours a day Yes, but not everybody has the brain power to write what you write. So the speed is one of the <laughs> think of the writing is another one. Norman, can you touch type? Links haven't appeared. You haven't got the... Um... No, I got them. They were there, Rob. They no, were. I think uh, writing the script I've, I've just written, I used to go into Nero's for a couple of hours and write a scene or two every day till I'd done it. And uh, I quite <laughs> like the speed I type. It's just right for the way I think and, uh, and it works. Yeah, it works. Totally right. Yes. Totally right. I don't know whether I do or not. No. <laughs> also, it's better for your hands because you've got the same RSI. You're exercising your fingers more. You don't have to look uh, at uh, a document if you're copy typing. You can look at the screen. You don't have to look at the keyboards. You make fewer mistakes. Right. I've just, I've just doubled your working life if you do it. And and next week, anyone who comes on this and uh, has learned how to touch type, I will get you a prize. Oh my God, you're giving prizes away now. Good. How can you prove it? How can you prove they, they can Well, there'll be, a, there'll be a speed test somewhere on, um, God, on the chat line. Online. Oh, speed oh, test on the chat line. Guys, I have got that. to go because I've got to be up on the common in five minutes time. All right, have a lovely time. And, and guys, you know, do do get out a bit if, if you possibly can, but stay safe, really stay, stay safe. safe. Stay we safe. want you back next week for uh, Quick Quig. A quick. Okay, See you for a quick. Norman, thanks again. So lovely to see no you, problem. mate.